You're listening to Truflation Spaces on X. This episode is our monthly pre-CPI inflation analysis with, of course, the Truflation team, CEO Stefan Roost, head of data Ivan Yelich, and head of product Oliver Roost. Guests today include Omar Yahia, head of investments at Matter Labs and ZK Sync, and Raul Paul of Real Vision and Global Macro Investor, of course, for an exclusive AMA. Before we jump into all of that, we're sponsored by Truflation Premium, a granular look at inflation data from millions of points uh, for the U.S. and U.K., available to businesses, investors, and those who wish to stay in the know way ahead of the game. Uh, just head over to truflation.com, click the black uh, download data button, and choose a plan that suits you best. Uh, before we jump into our official analysis here, I'm going to make sure we have all of our speakers queued, ready to go. Take care of some uh, some housekeeping here. Um, let's see. Looks like we've got most up and ready to go. Um, we're waiting for a few to accept our invite here. Um Obviously, we're looking at a pre-CPI, uh, a pre-BLS a CPI print, that is, uh, tomorrow, that um, I guess at this point it sits right at 3% is the official number. Uh, as we speak, the Truflation CPI print for today is 2.33%. Um, that, of course, uh, is uh, seems to be, at least as far as we've seen over the last uh, year um, or some change, that uh, we are ahead of the game, and who knows where it's going to go. And for that, we usually turn to our head of product, uh, our analyst, um, Oliver Roost, who basically does deep, deep dives on this. And it's a great way to get started, kind of uh, think about uh, our discussion today with uh, Raul and Omar. Um, Oliver, thanks so much for, for coming back on, man. Um, what What are you seeing? <laughs> Hey, thanks a lot for having me back on. I'm excited for this one. It should be a really interesting, uh, interesting session ahead. Um, so yeah, what are we seeing? Um, we are first of all seeing a finally a reversal um, and forecasting a reversal of trends um, of the CPI trend that we've had in the past few months. Um, and in fact, we are seeing an increase of CPI expected. Um, as you rightly corrected, last month they landed on the BLS landed on a three percent increase. Uh, we're seeing it now projecting further up uh, to three point four percent. The market is expecting somewhere between two point seven and three point four. So it's a pretty varied um, increase. If you take out the two outliers on either side, you're looking at an average increase from about forty four estimates. Um, taking you to about 3.34%. Um, what are some of the drivers of our forecast of an increase to 3.4, i.e. the truflation forecast? Um, we believe there are going to be more increases in the service-based economies because of the tight labor market. Um, what are those service increases? They're things like food away from home, um, utilities, uh, vehicle expenses, other lodgings. Um, health services, although there is some increase also in spending on food at home as well. Um, then you're seeing a much more rapid decline in other goods, more of the good side factors. Um, they include things like car purchases, apparel. Um, but surprisingly also, we're starting to see a decline in housing, in owned housing, uh, which is, seems to be a bit of a reversal trend what we've seen in the previous months. So, that's all exciting news to see those trends. Um, we are seeing a slowdown on a month-on-month -month level. So if we look compared to the rate of increase month-on-month, um, -month, uh, this month in June compared to May and May compared to April and so forth, um, we're starting to see that rate slow down. Um, but if I look at the rate of slowdown this year versus the rate of slowdown this time last year, it's a lot um, slower last this year, the rate of decline versus it was last year. Um, so therefore, on an annualized basis, you're starting to see that the rate of increase increasing. So that's the big drivers uh, that we're expecting. Um, some causes of concern, I think, for the future. 
Um, we're continuing to see a tight labor market where lab labor is now the, the BLS reported, uh, well, it's part of labor, actually, sorry, reported um, uh, unemployment rate at 3.5 percent, still seeing wage increases increasing. Um, and for the first time in a long time, you're starting to see purchasing power uh, improve as the wage increases outstrip um, uh, wage uh, w uh, inflation. So wage increasing is faster than inflation. And no surprise, you're seeing that drive increase in retail expenditure. Um, and GDP is up 2.5% as reported last month, um, up from 2% in Q1. Now, a lot of that is inflationary driven. So take that with a, with a pinch of salt. Um, but it, what is scary about these numbers is that businesses are investing more into their future as well. So I think if you look at the sort of other factors that, that cause a bit of concern um, is obviously the shrinking buffers that consumers are having. One, um, consumer debt is increasing in the U.S. Uh, it continues to increase. Um, we're seeing the buffer that people have in wallets in their wallets be because of the the uh, sh because of the hunkering down of the last two years. Um, we're seeing household savings, so to speak, um, at, uh, diminish. Um, it was up at 2.5 trillion during COVID and post COVID. That was part of because how individuals and consumers were hunkering down. Uh, there was also the um, the stimulus packages that the government was offering out, um, but now it's depleted down to about 1.5 trillion, right? So that rate of reduction is is uh, be that because of interest rates and so forth is a bit of a concerning effect. Um, and also, you know, the pent up demand or the revenge spending, as we want to call it, or the revenge behaviors, uh, is uh, that pent up demand for consumers is is causing a bit of concern of increased you know, driving the economy, right? And that consumer expenditure accounts for 70% of, of the GDP. So, you know, as consumer expenditure, consumer spending continues, no doubt we'll see consumer GDP, the US GDP continue to improve as well. So that's a bit very high level of what's happening. Um, I'll pass over to anybody else who wants to make a call. But yes, we, uh, true inflation is, as a result of all of that, we are expecting... Um, uh, the re reversal of CPI to get to 3.4%. And we are expecting um, a continued elevation of that forecast, not only for July, but also later on in the year, all rolling up into the back end of the year, where we're con seeing continued, um, ever, uh, continued elevation of the CPI number until the end of the year. So that's our call from uh, head of product, Oliver Rust at Truflation.com. Um, and you are, of course, listening to Truflation Spaces. We've got a special guest today, Raul Paul. He's best known as a financial analyst, ex Goldman Sachs, founder of the influential uh, newsletter Global Macro Investor, and co founder slash CEO of Real Vision, a financial media and education platform. Raul, we really appreciate you doing this, man. We're all super excited to have you on. Good to be here, my friend. All right. So it's also a good time to bring in the Truflation team. Uh, that includes CEO Stefan Roost and head of data Ivan Yellick. And we also have on uh, our, our recurring uh, guru and insightful um, analyst. Uh, that, of course, would be head of investments out at Matter Labs and ZK Sync, um, Omar Yahia. So, gentle persons, um, I'll let you take it. Um, you can bang away at. Um, at uh, Raul here. Uh, why don't we start with Stefan? I know, uh, Stefan, you've, uh, uh, you and Raul share kind of a, a passion for being a little bit more optimistic about AI, right? Yeah, no, no. And I, I, I definitely um, think that, you know, if we're looking at a, at a longer term cycle versus just this, this last month and the month of July, you know, is, how do we generate growth in order to service the debt in the U.S.? We need to generate and create growth. And the only time that really the U.S. had a budget surplus was during the period of the dot-com days, right? And what was the growth driver there was dot-com. I mean, it was e-commerce, the Internet. It drove a lot of new jobs, created a lot of new wealth, a lot of new money went into these projects and ultimately 
each of these projects drove to become tech behemoths that we see today. At the same time, you also have a large number of um, you know, I mean, money was cheap at the time, so you can argue that a lot of money went into that those projects. And each of those projects, not all of them made it, a lot of them failed, but all of them sort of ended up having to pay taxes. You had income tax for the people that were working at these multitude of dot-com projects. And a lot of them were also acquired and consolidated into bigger organizations. Um, and we look at where is the growth going to come from? Where is new employment going to come from, right? Where is new productivity gains going to come from whilst at the same time lowering the unit cost of, you know, um, uh, productivity? And to me, AI is going to be a core element that's going to support that growth and bring down the cost, right? And, you know, Raul, I think you had made a really good statement, which I really opened my eye into having a very unique perspective was really around oil, right? Oil and the cost of energy being at a pretty much consistent um, unit per GDP um, over the last sort of, you know, a couple of decades. And how, you know, and, and, and so if that stays the case and oil now price going up, how are we going to offset that? And maybe AI plays a contributing factor in terms of bringing down and holding, again, that unit cost to GDP or that ratio to GDP oil price. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting aspect. But how do we get growth again? I mean, that's, to me, the bigger question. So uh, GDP growth is driven by a simple formula, which is basically population growth, productivity, or debt growth. We hit the debt growth limits back in 2008. So all debt growth now is just servicing of, of existing debt. Uh, I've proven that out with my work in GMI. That's essentially all that's going on. Um, now, obviously, if interest rates rise, then you have to even borrow more money. But that's, that's basically at that level. When we're looking at population growth, well, demographics is destiny. And it's, it's, it's baked in the cake now for the next 30 years that populations around the world are going to shrink. The US population... Uh, uh, birth death rate has collapsed now. So there is no increase from GDP. There is a slight increase in GDP from population growth in the United States versus other countries because the, millenni the millennial cohort had kids. Some of them had kids. Um, and then after that, you've really got to deal with productivity. So what is productivity? Really, all technology does since the beginning of time is increase productive output per unit of energy. Kilojoule. Now, when we were all farm workers, it was based around, you know, what we ate versus what we could, what we could produce from the fields. Then we brought mechanization, and that was an increase in that. And then after that, sorry, the dogs are knocking here. Then oh, it's okay, we love dogs. <laughs> then, then after that, it's been the application of technology per unit of electricity or if you want to get broader than that, per unit of energy, per kilojoule. So if you look at the overall long-term price of oil, um, inflation adjusted over the last 60 years, it's basically been $40 in inflation adjusted terms forever. And so it's basically a fixed input cost. And so technology, compute power, all of these things, the advances in, in uh, semiconductors, all of this has allowed for um, more productivity per unit of energy. Okay, great. But there were two, there were several things happening in this period called, that I call the exponential age, which is this massive nexus of all these technologies hitting at the same time. Is firstly, productivity is increasing dramatically because all technology was basically increasing um, human manpower and speeding up human manpower. That's where the productivity was coming from. That was everything from Excel spreadsheets to computers. They didn't think. The next part of this is AI. So that's the, whether it's the human creativity layer or whether it's the, um, the knowledge layer. Now, knowledge was scarcity. That's why lawyers are paid so much and doctors are paid so much. We have just changed that entire equation. And it's not yet apparent to people where this is going to go, but that's a, a destruction in the scarcity of knowledge because it's now abundant. In fact, it's infinitely abundant. So you have infinitely abundant knowledge and basically... As compute power keeps going up with Moore's law and others, we end up with infinite compute power as well. So 
that drives productivity and we should see that filtering through as AI starts coming through into the workforce, into our daily lives. The other part of the equation is the energy cost. So we're seeing a massive dramatic transformation in the energy mix in Europe and other countries as they are forced to go off oil. Now that may lead some structural rigidities in oil for the time being because of the supply issues. But generally speaking, the bet that the Europeans are making and increasingly the rest of the world is that if we can pour enough money into um, renewable energy, and I'll include nuclear in that, then we can eventually lower the cost. So we're seeing cost of electricity driven by renewables collapsing below um, any fossil fuel sources of energy. Problem is, it's, it's not scalable enough yet to replace, but over time that will happen. So what you get is imagine if productivity is going up from technology and the energy cost goes from an equivalent of $40 a barrel down to $10 a barrel. Okay, that is a massive multiplier in productivity, and that finally changes the the debt deflation cycle. Well, it won't change the deflation cycle, but it'll change the debt cycle and the growth cycle permanently. Um, and that's what I'm very focused on. Also, at the same time, the baby boomers um, end up dying off, and what you end up is is increasing GDP per capita. Now, a lot of that obviously accrues to these tech giants. We need to see how that that plays out over time. But at a structural level, that's how I see the world playing out. And with, there's there's lots of talk now in the uh, TradFi um, legacy press, the financial press, about China and deflation. And I've seen a few, over the past few months, a few uh, um, gadflies and wags kind of say that, you know, they, they've sort of teased the, the the deflation uh, word out there a bit, but you've been hardcore on this. And whenever you go to the mat for something, I'm usually first to kind of go, mm, I don't know, Raul. And then five or six months, I go, oh, well, he knew it all along. <laughs> so it seems like you were ahead of the the deflation call. Um, is that? Are I heard you mention it in your uh, analysis just now. Are, are you sticking with um, the, the fall to, to deflation? Yes. So, you know, I do a huge amount of work. I've been doing global, writing Global Macro Investor for the last 19 years. Uh, myself and Julian Bittle probably have, you know, one and a half thousand charts of which we use in our database to build our uh, models and, and frameworks of understanding from. Inflation is obviously one of the large inputs. So I look at this in multiple levels. I don't rely on just one thing. So a simple level, if we use the trueflation data, it leads by one month. So trueflation in May was roughly 3%. And lo and behold, the June CPI numbers come out roughly 3%. The June trueflation number was about average 2.8%. So I think there's a recent chance I don't do month by month forecasts. It's a waste of time. I look at trends generally. But generally speaking, I think the 3.3 number is likely to be overly optimistic. That's my general view. And if we look at where... Um, where July has been trending in trueflation, it's been 2.2%, which would be the numbers reported in September. So I see the ongoing lead of the trueflation data. That's one. We also then go back and look at the big macro picture. We've taken every single inflation episode from the 1940s through to the 1980s, where we had you know, significant inflation. We just averaged those out, looked at it, compared to it, and it's been following that trajectory, which is an ongoing disinflation. Um, it's actually been accelerating past it, which has been our forecast, because we see all of the component parts of inflation deflating. So our forecast for inflation is essentially for inflation to hit zero by year end around then. And that's headline CPI. And then core CPI follows in 2024, and I think may even go negative. And that's driven by not only the base effects year on year, but also the rapid change in some of the components to core CPI. So the headline effect, we've got stuff like fertilizer prices are going to be bringing down food prices. They lead it by uh, three months or so. We've got many, many leads that just continue down. Commodity price, I know a lot of people are starting to think there's a commodity price balance. We don't see it um, anywhere. And commodities are a small part of the inflation forecast. Wage terms, stuff like the Dallas and Fed, um, the, uh, Dallas Fed and the uh, Richmond Fed, we kind of average those out and use those as a forecast. Wages and benefits have been falling dramatically. We see that 
in a number of uh, pieces of data. So the sticky elements of wage inflation, we think, continue lower and sharply lower over time. So we've got food inflation falling, wage inflation falling. Then we use stuff like the Schiller Case 20 Composite Home Price Index year on year, compare that against CPI, uh, it lead, uh, shelter CPI. Shelter CPI is a huge part, it's 35% of total C CPI and 60% of um, services CPI. Um, that is um, Schiller Home Price Index leads by 15 months. So that gives us forecasts of um, core CPI really just continuing to deflate. So we also look at stuff like the Atlanta Core Sticky Fed Index. That um, X shelter has been collapsing. We know the shelter number uh, is coming down as well. So across every single data point that we've got, um, we've basically got an ongoing disinflation happening where headline inflation followed by core inflation uh, get to zero and in some cases deflation. Now, <clears throat> obviously after that, you'll have an up cycle in the business cycle and that will lead to the usual rebound um, in, um, in CPI. Again, we, we're not believers in the structural CPI story. I know people are using wages, but you need to offset some of that versus the um, uh, labor force participation rate because the labor force participation rate keeps collapsing. So there's less people getting those higher wages over time. And then we've got the AI and technology. So we actually think it's going to be pretty sluggish coming out the other side. But we will get you know the usual cyclical inflation pickup as commodity prices pick up, et cetera, the other side of this cycle. Uh, but we think it's normal. We think really um, everything that we look at was really supply chain driven and the supply chain dynamics. If we look at you know the New York Fed supply chain stuff, that gives us deflation this year as well. So that's kind of where we're coming from. Uh, we don't see a bounce in inflation. Now, month or month, you know, one month to the next, I don't really care. It's not the thing I forecast. For me, what matters is living out into the future six to nine months. That's where the investment time horizon is, particularly in global macro, which is why we managed to catch the bottom of um, the markets, particularly technology and all the things that were getting beaten by inflation and liquidity. Our liquidity analysis also gives us uh, um, negative or zero uh, inflation going into year end. So there's a ton of stuff that we look at. Doesn't mean we're always right. Um, but we've got, for us, a pretty good house of cards that suggests that this continues. You're listening to Trueflation.com. Spaces with um, special guest Raul Paul of Real Vision and Global Macro Investors. Uh, we have uh, also a guest with us, Omar Yahia of Matter Labs and ZK Sync, who has a question. And before I, I patch him in, uh, this is an AMA, so we want listeners uh, to also um, ask of, of Raul. Um, you've got a chance uh, for the next uh, half an hour or so. Um, to get uh, your comments and questions into him. So do that either by requesting us in the app, as some people have, or just at us on X in the thread, and we'll do our best to get uh, your questions to Oral. Anyway, um, no more uh, vamping here. Omar, go right ahead. Bro, it's great, to, uh, it's great to be with you here. I have two questions for you. Um, one about the renewable uh, energy versus oil transition. And the other about um, uh, the structural change in the way uh, uh, central banks are going to operate in this new regime. Uh, the first, we, we've already started to see some cracks in um, the funding for some of these renewable sources. We've seen Siemens have huge write downs uh, in terms of their base technology, that basically a lot of the models that they have. Um, would cost a fortune to keep running. We've seen we've seen headline news that uh, um, uh, basically businesses is, is not as usual in that regard. Uh, I, I agree in principle that if you throw enough money at a problem, you can solve it. But the question becomes, how big is your uh, uh, war chest um, uh, to justify uh, trying to subsidize these versus perhaps uh, pursuing the the traditional oil route, which when coupled with uh, these new increases in productivity, uh, you can actually uh, start to see some proper uh, GDP growth that comes from aggregate productivity um, and trying to reduce the ratio of, uh, of uh, output to debt. And the the other question- um, Hold on, hold on, there's two, uh, you, the questions are too long. Too many. Too, too long. Too many. Um, so 
on the renewable side and the amount of money it costs, this is going to sound ridiculous. It's irrelevant. <laughs> and it's irrelevant because of the magic money printing machine. So every major government, the Fed, sorry, every major central bank, the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of England, the BOJ, the PBOC, uh, and a whole bunch of others are monetizing the interest payments on their debts. And what that does is mutualize the cost across the population, particularly for the workers, because asset prices rise and people on salaries which don't rise as much as asset prices get, their future selves essentially get poorer. This will continue ad infinitum until this problem, problem is solved because there is no way to deal with the debt. So I believe that they are all acutely aware of the issue that they're facing, uh, which is why all of the debt payments are being monetized three and a half years after being issued. It's one of the reasons I think we have a lot of stimulus coming this year. It's also one of the reasons I think the central banks have been overly hawkish on purpose so they can get inflation and unemployment down so they've got the excuse. So how do they do it? How do they get the political backing to do this? And it's simple. It's the magic old trick, which is recession. You know, there's two things that allow you to do anything in politics. One is a recession, the other is war. And we've had both. Well, we're having both. So, you know, that the Russian-Ukraine uh, situation, that war had led very clearly to an acceleration in Europe to this idea of energy independence. Of course they were going to use it for that. They know they have to get productivity higher and they have to get productivity higher fast because Europe has a really aging population and a really big debt problem. Um, and the US has been slower on it. Why? Because they have a less aging population. Um, so, you know, th there's a lot of mechanics as once you see what I call the everything code, you can't unsee it. So I don't believe it is in most people's interests to have oil at the center of the geopolitical system. Um, for the reasons that we've seen with Russia. And we don't know where the situation of China and the multipolar world is going to lead to. But what, you've, what you do know with 100% certainty is the biggest strategic mistake you can ever make is not having your source of energy um, secure. So that, that's what's going on here. They will put unlimited amounts of money. Mistake that you should ever... Sorry, continue, your role. So, so th that's what I think they will do is the is um, continue to do this. Now, that comes with a cost, as I said. You're printing money, and what you're doing is driving up asset prices. So, at core, yes, we will continue to see technological advances in oil. But if you've seen for the first time that um, renewable investment is now exceeding um, the investment in the oil sector. And that's a, that's a secular trend that will continue. And then obviously we've got the ability to add nuclear into the mix. Everybody's been slow at that. I don't really understand why they've been slow at that, um, but they have been, and you know, the Germans have been going into reverse while the Finns- Yeah, they went the other direction. Well. That's right. And what we've seen, you know, we're seeing India moving that way. China's clearly moving that way. You know, Josh Wolf was talking about this recently in Congress. Um, we will see that, that change because it changes the equation. Now, the other thing that's going on that I don't know where we are with this, with this amazing saga playing out with this IK99, the um, superconductor. But if that's the case, it changes everything, literally everything. So th there's a lot going on in this equation. Peaceful. Um, Go ahead. And the the you said the magic words, um, Raul, the magic money printer, I know, uh, You've been a, a longtime advocate of not viewing uh, the price of assets denominated in currencies, but rather in uh, balance sheets, in in central bank balance sheets. So, where does this in in the, in this new paradigm? Where does this leave the U.S. dollar in particular? Well, this is all a game of relative purchasing power. Now, what we've seen is over time, all of the central banks have been doing the same. So, what you get is this optical illusion where the dollar doesn't collapse. The euro doesn't collapse over time. Yes, the structural inefficiencies of the euro goes lower. The dollar actually ends up going higher most of the time because 
Most of the world's debt is denominated in dollars, and every time the global economy slows down, everyone's scrambling for those dollars. So you've got a structural bid to the dollar, which is the dollar milkshake theory that you've heard so much about. And I've been a dollar bull for uh, over a decade now, and that's, that's played out pretty well. I do not see that equation changing. And people say, yeah, but China, they're, they're, they're going to get off the dollar. They can't. They owe so much fucking money in dollars. There's no way without nuking their entire economy. So everybody understands that this game is not a game that you can walk away from the dollar quickly. The U if the US is printing um, money, well, so are the Europeans, and so are the Japanese, and so are the Chinese, and so are the Brits, and so are the Canadians, and so are the Australians. You know, And that's the issue, and that's why assets rise, really, is because you're, you're debasing all fiat. You're listening to Truflation.com Spaces. With uh, an AMA um, put to Raul Paul, um, he is putting on a clinic, and uh, it, you'd be wise to get in here, uh, get your questions and comments to us either in app um, by um, requesting to speak or adding us in the thread. Uh, before we get to some listener um, questions here, we've got our head of data, um, Ivan Yellick, with his hand up. Uh, go ahead, Ivan. Hi, and, and thank you for uh, hosting this again, and thank you for joining us, Raul. Just one question in regards to your model. I love the fact that you are monitoring what you mentioned, 14, 1500 of charts, um, and would like to hear your view on how all of those are predicting or showing where the labor market is going, because that is next to the inflation, it's really another important uh, area that will impact uh, and have domino effect on the other other uh, areas like interest rates and so on. So what's your view on that? And what, what does the data show there? Where is the labor market going? So we show exactly the same thing for the labor market. Again, the labor market lags like inflation by about nine months or so. So that's why the Fed have been late because they're living in that in, the, in that period. But if we look at, for example, the ISM has a six month lead on US unemployment rate, that suggests that the unemployment rate starts rising from here. We also look at the ISM versus non-farm payrolls. That starts suggesting that towards the end of the year, non-farm payrolls go negative. Um, we look at um, non-farm private sector payrolls, and we have our own uh, proxy survey there. That gives us kind of negative 300,000 prints in the, in the private sector payrolls. Um, we look at stuff like jobless claims as a percentage of deviation from 12-month rolling lows. They're at levels that we see in a recession, and they tend to keep going. So there's... Again, every single part of the inflation uh, of the unemployment segment, it's everybody's got to understand everything is lagged. So, so when you're looking at things now, it, it's all lagged. It's lagged by nine months versus where ISM is generally. So, generally speaking, we see nothing but employment softening. Now, we do not see a mega em employment cycle because of the structure of the workforce. So this is really important. We're going to be writing a piece about this, about how it played out in Japan. Is Jap Japan has had low unemployment in and out of recessions. And the reason that has happened is because of the structure of the workforce, because there's so many retirees versus workers. But it hasn't led to wage inflation in Japan. And I don't think it will lead to wage inflation in the West because of the advent, yeah, because of technology and a whole bunch of other issues. But generally speaking, we would expect unemployment to rise maybe 100 basis points um from the low maybe it goes a bit further than that but we expect it to remain a bit sticky afterwards um but again wait and see because once you get further out which we're talking like 20 mid 2024 we're then starting to have less granularity and clarity on forecasts so it becomes much more probabilistically based so yeah generally speaking we see nothing but um a rise in unemployment nothing shocking enough to give the Fed the cover that they need and the other central banks to give it the cover that they need to um, reverse course and bring back the money printers for the reasons we talked about. Mm. And, stuff and so if they bring Go back, Raul, just quickly, sorry, just if they bring back the money printer and they, they, they put in a lot of money into the supply, will that not drive inflation again? I mean, there's going to no. be a whole, no. no okay. money, printing, no, money printing does not drive inflation. This is a complete misunderstanding by everybody. There is no statistical link between money printing and inflation. 
What money printing does is create asset inflation in optical terms because of the That's debasement true, yeah. of the currency. It does not increase your wages. It never has done. It doesn't increase net aggregate demand either. So that's the issue here is it, it doesn't do those things. Really, inflation is driven at a cyclical level by supply dynamics and demand dynamics. Um, so when the economy's recovering, inflation rises. If you've got supply constraints, big issues, then inflation rises more than expected. If you don't and you have relatively stable supply conditions, then you just get a normal cyclical inflation. That's how inflation generally works. You can't make it structurally um, in these types of economies. Once you go to um, a non kind of reserve currency economy, let's say Turkey, something else, well, that becomes very different because then you get capital flight and you get a whole bunch of other issues that cause uh, inflation at countrywide level. All right. And uh, let's bring in some listeners now. Um, Drew Roberts, I think you're first up. Uh, go ahead, brother, for Raul or uh, any one of the panel. GM friends, uh, Raul, my Twitter experience improved greatly when I turned on notifications for your tweets and replies. Uh, you got some good replies, so thank you. Um, have you ever read a book called Debt by David Graeber? Yes, of course. I find that fascinating. He, he convinced me, uh, Adam Smith, I just don't agree with so I don't know. It's, it's an interesting one if you're if you're in the listener gallery. Um, how? So my question is this: How destabilizing is it to make internet money out of thin air, like a significant amount? See, I think the internet money out of thin air. I'm presuming you're talking about crypto, which I know you're a crypto person. Um, yeah, shit coins essentially. Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't really have a view on that. What? But I do know, and I, one of my theses is why I got involved in crypto since 2012-13 was really based on the fact that if you've got a broken financial system where nobody has any ownership of anything, proven ownership of anything, in addition, you have um, a need for the financial system to operate on different rails so people have the ability to opt out, then crypto has a great opportunity. And that's the larger cryptocurrencies. The rest, of it, I don't really care about. And next up is uh, Will Bank from Listener's. Um, go ahead, Will. Hi, uh, Raul. Thanks very much, uh, by the way, Trueflation, for everything you've done. It's been really great to track that over the last couple of years. Um, I'm an RVIP member. I'm a big fan of the Everything Code, Raul. So thanks for everything you've done with that. It's quite amazing. Um, just pick him up on a couple of things. Yeah, let, let's see if it works out. It's still a theory. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not betting the whole house on it, but I've got, I've got most of the house on it. Um, uh, so a couple of things that you mentioned. Um I, I understand that, you know, um, balance sheet uh, inflation, um, asset price inflation doesn't necessarily cause economic inflation in the manner in which we understand it. But um, surely one of the uh, aspects of the current situation is that we're going to see commodity price inflation, mainly because a lot of the countries that do generate a good deal of the world's critical commodities, uh, particularly the new age commodities, um, are looking to double down on their place in the world. And they aren't willing to live in a necessarily in a, in a dollar denominated structure or, or, or you know, in the in the way perhaps they've been forced to. So does that commodity inflation then start to actually produce real world economic inflation in your opinion? So I go back to the time that we actually had massive demand led inflation, when supply was not able to catch up with demand. And that was when China came onto the world stage. So back then, um, we saw the price of oil hitting 140 bucks. We saw the, one of the biggest commodity bull markets of all time. At its peak, inflation got to 6% and then collapsed to negative. Really, over that entire period in time, inflation was running at about 3.5%. So no, because commodities are only a small part of inflation. This is a myth narrative that's come out of the 70s and the kind of gold bulls around inflation and that commodities cause it. Commodities are such a small part of what the overall inflation um, picture is. And it's the rate of change of the commodities 
that really is the big driver here. And you have to have multiple hundreds of percent in some of this stuff to really drive long-term inflation because it's like 18% or whatever of, of total CPI, headline CPI and less of core. So um, yes, we will see commodity prices rise. Yes, we will see potentially structural imbalances in, in um, copper and a bunch of other stuff. Yes, yes, yes. And yes, we will have inflation in the next business cycle. So that's 2025, 2026, 2027. We will see, you know, a pickup of inflation and everybody will be yelling to say inflation is going to back to the highs. Look at this. It's it's the 1970s over again, all over again. And the likelihood is it gets crushed by technology. Look, there's not a single person alive in financial markets who doesn't understand there's a shortage of copper. Every single producer, every single country, every single uh, company understands that. They all understand the problems with lithium. They all know this. So if we've got everybody with a knowable complication around uh, the, the b basic, basic metals and other resources that they need, they have enough time to plan and think around it. And we've already seen companies taking action. So um, I tend to find that the commodity analysts uh, are only supply-driven analysts, and they don't look at demand. We've got to get through. I mean, the best person on this is Dwight Anderson, who's been on Real Vision a few times. Dwight understands both sides of the equation. Most people don't. Most people just look at supply and assume demand is linear. It doesn't. It goes up and down with the business cycle. So we need to ask ourselves, how long is demand going to be slow for, considering we're pretty much in a global recession right now, and a relatively mild one? How long does it drag on for? Um, I don't think it drags on that long, but how long? How strong is growth out of the other side? And do we have commodity-intensive industries driving that growth or technology-intensive industries or people-intensive industries? And those are the structural factors we need to look out for. So I'm, I do believe commodity prices go back up again. Some of them will be crazy. I don't think it's a structural inflation issue. You're listening to Truflation Spaces with Raul Paul of Real Vision and global macro investor. Um, it's an AMA. Um, we've got some listeners here um, who want uh, to get in. And Balpreet, I think you're next up. Go ahead, brother. Thank you. Hey, Raul. Um, been reading a lot of your work. Um, great work. So thank you. Um, for uh, Why do you think Japan, China, kind of the Asian economies are leading the, the credit cycle, the demographics, the debt, yield curve control um, ahead of the West? Yeah, simple population age. I mean, everything is demographics, and I've spent a lifetime proving this out. I mean, literally everything, all of the trends that we observe over time uh, are all driven by demographics, and Japan's an older population. So even the trends of youth not dating, not having kids, uh, living, you know, having AI girlfriends, and that happened in Japan 15 years ago. It just completely leads what, what is happening everywhere else in the world. And it's because it's, it's based on demographics. And so I pay real attention to it. And everybody goes, well, this can't be the same. It will be the same. The US will use yield curve control, whether it's the next or Europe will definitely use yield curve control. Um, and they want the cover for yield curve control because if you can get, if you can hold it, and this is what the Japanese are doing, if you can hold your yields below the trend rate of GDP, um, then you have less de debt service payments. Um, and what we found is that, yes, with yield curve control, the Japanese printed money, but they didn't print ridiculous amounts of money because, I, I don't know, the market seems to be comfortable with, with understanding that bond yields are pegged below the, the trend rate of growth. So it's been amazing to see Japan, uh, China, I'm not sure why the China credit cycle leads so far because that's the furthest data point that we've got on our everything code format. Uh, I don't like relying on one uh, data piece, but it seems that the Chinese cycle leads. Part of that is the demographic cycle. Other parts is where they lie on the production curve um, and manufacturing curve versus every, every, everything else and how credit driven that, that economy has been. But uh, yeah, it's fascinating to see. Next up is listener Jay. Go ahead, Jay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks, Raul, for being here. Uh, so my question is on the uh, inflation and the uh, Federal Reserve uh, interest rate path. So we, we already see that um, CPI 
you know x shelter which is lagged is below two percent and probably in the next uh, couple prints even the core will be less than two percent x shelter um, so when i guess how lagged would we see a response from the federal reserve in terms of um, i guess lowering the rates Yeah, I've uh, looked at this a lot. And for me, I think they get all the ground cover they ever want or ever need uh, in Q4. So I'm thinking by kind of October, November, um, we will see all of their inflation gauges below trend. See, uh, core won't be there yet, but it's on its way. As you said, minus shelter, you'll see it. Shelter's just super lagging. Um, so I think they'll have unemployment rising, inflation falling all by Q4 which is when they need to start servicing the interest payments. As we know, the interest payments are multiplying right now because these are the rolling over the debts from the pandemic um, and those need to be monetized. So I actually think, and I know it sounds like a crackpot theory, but they're purposely trying to overshoot inflation and unemployment so they can orchestrate uh, an ability to get rates back down to trend rate of GDP growth where they need to get it, which is kind of 1.75%. So. That, that, that's what I think plays out. This is one of the reasons I think that um, they've been more aggressive in the short-term bill market, uh, the Treasury has, than the longer-term bond market, because they'll roll the shorter-term bills uh, until they can get the rates down, and then they can go further out the curve to try and manage the debt. But most of the debt has been really at the three- to five-year um, sector, uh, and that every single central bank is the same, and they've all been paying the interest by printing money. So I think all of that dynamic is to play out. So I think the rate cuts start uh, Q4, and then um, the cowbell of the money printer comes in uh, 2024. All right. Next up, we have um, listener uh, Crypto. I'll go ahead, Crypto. Are you there, Crypto? Oh, hi, yeah, Trueflation. Sorry, guys. I, uh, I didn't realize yeah, I was going right, 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 on the stage that quickly. Uh, you kind of caught me off guard a little bit there. But uh, thank you for letting me up, number one. And uh, Ralph, uh, thank you very much, uh, number one, for your service to the community, for Real Vision, for, for giving that free content, and uh, and also for one of my absolute favorites of yours, which is the um, the, the, the exponential age. Um, as, a, as a global power engineer, it's something that I, uh, I, I, I've listened to a few times and, and find fascinating. Um, but uh, but not to waste too much of your time, I'll, I'll sort of get to my questions. So it, obviously we are, or not obviously, but um, but but we do participate in the in the in the, the cryptography space, and we want to use the technology for good. Um, and and with our project, um, the question, the direct question that I have is that um, our our project being a decentralised project, we want to try to support as many countries and people that that don't have access to the financial capital system. Now. My question is around the, the, the and, it's, and it's sort of based on, I suppose, the dollar, the dollar being the global reserve currency. What would be your advice, if it's okay to ask for advice and not to ask for a direct macro question, but um, what would be your advice um, for, a, for a hard asset monetary system that, that people can use? And I'm not talking just about the Bitcoin model, but, but in terms of being able to inflate and deflate a, a token so that you can, uh, especially you know, with the technology aspect that we have, we can inflate and deflate a token to protect the uh, the volatility at the earliest stages of the of the token launch. That that would be my question. If it's uh, if it's okay. Yeah, I mean that's a fascinating question, and I know a few people have looked at this to figure out can you have a less volatile currency by having a monetary policy that let's say it's still in a smart contract, but maybe uses you know some of the forward looking economic growth indicators to manage the supply and demand of of the currency. Look, I think it's a good idea. Can we get people to adopt it? Who the hell knows, right? I think the closest anybody got to a breakthrough, and that was hilarious when it happened, was when Facebook came out with Libra and they said, we want a basket of global currencies that includes the dollar, but is not the dollar's not the denominator. And the speed that that got shut down by the kind of rules-based global order system um, <laughs> was staggering because... Everybody knew that if you do that, Facebook has the largest network in the world, they would have just taken the world by storm with its own currency. 
um, which was essentially a basket currency, um, which is somewhat along the idea of the SDRs that have been out. I think that can be built on a stable coin um, and we need to think how that would be constructed. Um, but this, there's interesting things in basket currencies. I mean, there are some huge issues in world trade is why should South Africa, when it trades with Brazil, both have volatile currencies, why should they have to trade with dollars in the middle? Why should a South African economy or a Brazilian economy be driven by the dollar cycle as opposed to their own cycle? And you know, these are the things that many of these countries have been talking about. Even the EU has talked about this, is why should we be beholden to the dollar cycle in everything? Now, the hard point of the equation is they're all in debt in dollars, so they can't get out of the trap. But I know that people are looking at that to, to smooth volatility of how world trade works in, in this age. Very nice. Uh, Ridiculous, you are up. Yeah, thanks for uh, taking my question. Um, <clears throat> my, I have uh, actually two questions. The first one is about um, what do you make up of that uh, melt up theory? Is that something too radical for you or like that the S&P 500 is increasing by 30% in the next six months? Is that something you could imagine? And then the second part um, uh, also about uh, crypto. Is, is crypto, is that a, more like of an investment vehicle for you or do you, do you uh, uh, agree on, on targets for Bitcoin like 1 million in 2030 or so? Thank you. Okay, I try not to get into too much targets-based stuff because everybody on Twitter wants them, and then when they don't work, they then they then troll you to death. It's just it's, it's just pointless. Um, my theory on the melt-up idea is: look, I don't come at this in the same way that a lot of people come at this. You know, I use this every, everything code framework based on liquid, global liquidity analysis, and all of our forward-looking stuff suggests that uh, yes, that's that there is a decently high probability that we get much higher asset prices. That we've been long um, all year and from about October in technology. Um, crypto, we, you know, from our liquidity indicators, we added ETH in June and uh, more stuff in October and again at the beginning of the year. So from a liquidity-based analysis, uh, which is what we're using, plus the business cycle overlays, yes, we think that there's a, decent chance that we get a very strong year end and a very strong 2024. Um, so that's on that. And sorry, what was the question on crypto again? Um, another kind of price call, the looking out to a uh, million dollars by 2030. That's what yeah. I'm... Okay. So how I approach that is I understand that crypto is driven by Metcalf's law, which is the kind of number of users on the network and the kind of value exchange on the network as a proxy for the number of connections on that network between the, the nodes. Um, when I look at um, wallet addresses, and I posted this on Twitter last week, week before, that I annually update, um, we're at 425 million wallets. The trend rate of growth, if we use the uh, adoption of the internet, because um, what happens is these trends slow down over time as they become more mature. So we're using a 42% trend rate of growth, which is what uh, the internet did at this stage in its adoption cycle. We rebased both of them to the first million users and then took it from there. Um, last year, crypto did 42% in a 70% down year. So I actually think the trend rate of growth of crypto is still 100% a year or more, but we'll see over the full cycles. So that gets us to 5.5 billion users by 2030. At 5.5 billion users at 2030, what is the market cap? of this asset class at that point. Well, it's probably 100 trillion or so. So, you know, you can extrapolate out, you know, if Bitcoin continues to hold its value over that time, then it could be worth a lot more money. And my price target when I first ever started, you know, when I first bought Bitcoin in 2013, it was $200. And I did the kind of stock to flow ratio maths of what this thing could be worth. And I said, listen, I think it's worth a million bucks. And it's trading at 200. I'm going to discount myself for being an idiot by 90%. So it's worth $100,000. That was back then. And $200 is the best risk reward I've ever seen in my entire life. And that's why I bought it. And that, I still think, pretty much stands. So over time, I see adoption rising. You know, central bank digital currencies are going to be built on blockchain rails, credit card rails, blockchain rails, securities markets, blockchain rails, 
all of this will take us you know a part of the ledger uh, of whichever ledger that is whether it's ethereum or solana or whatever xrp and really matter that will all increase the value of these networks um and then i i continue to see maybe out until as far as 2030, the ongoing use of central bank balance sheets to manage the debt situations until the productivity um, miracle kicks in. And so that would continue to drive the price of these assets as well. So yeah, I remain structurally bullish. I've not changed my view. Nothing's really changed. Uh, expect ups and downs of 80% as part of the journey. And, get, and, and over time, if you hold it long enough, you get overcompensated for the risk by the returns. Very nice. We're um, in the interest of time here. I'm going to look at a few of the questions that are under the thread. Um, let me just kind of rattle them off, Raul, and then you kind of pick what you feel is uh, germane or most interesting to you. Uh, comment, uh, ask for a comment here on U.S. residential commercial real estate. Um, there's something here about Turkey's scheme to compensate depositors for slippage relative to the U.S. dollar. Um, I think you already talked about nuclear power, uh, Bitcoin you just addressed. Um, let's see. Um, lots of great comments about uh, your, your answers here. Um, lastly, do you see broad unemployment increasing prior to increased QE or stimulus? Anyway, that's a lot to throw at you. <laughs> um, is there anything there that uh, that, that piques you? Uh, no, I think we covered most of the ground on that. Um, mm -hmm. I th yeah, I think we've covered a lot of the ground there. Okay. And then I shall bring up another listener here. It uh, looks like we have... Um, Mizel, go ahead, Mizel. Or Mizel, go ahead, Mizel, yeah, Mizel. Thank you. Hi, hi uh -huh. Robert. First of all, thanks for everything you do. I love all the content around Real Vision, and thanks, Truflation, Truflation for this AMA. I just want to clarify my understanding of the core thesis, uh, and specifically the mechanics of the everything code you've put out, especially the lag between interest payments and the growth of central bank balance sheets is something I'm still trying to wrap my head around. Is the idea there that when interest payments come due for the U.S. government, for example, they issue new bonds to pay for those interest payments, and then the payment, the interest payments on those new bonds comes due three to five years later, and then the central bank essentially monetizes those interest payments through QE or open market operations, and then it's a sort of a vicious, vicious cycle that keeps on going. Is that a correct understanding? And could you tell us a bit about how you came upon this realization or finding what was the aha moment for you? Uh, yeah, that's exactly the interpretation. Um, the aha moment was a comment by Mike Howell offhandedly that everything is a refi cycle now. Look, I'm a student of the business cycle. I've been using the business cycle for 30 years. Um, but the business cycle has become like a metronome. It's clockwork right now. And I'm like, huh. I was looking at the ISM. I'm like, why is this exactly three and a half years apart? There's a peak in our ISM. So that got me digging into, okay, maybe Mike's right. So I start looking at the um, all of the uh, the debt structures of the major economies. And I realize, yes, they are all in this three and a half, uh, this average three and a half year to four year window. It also mirrored bizarrely the Bitcoin halving cycle because it was all I think the great reset happened in 2008. That's that's the understanding I now suddenly have had is that the debt jubilee wasn't you're not paying the debt, it's you're not paying the interest on the debts, we're cutting all interest rates to zero. And they've been managing those interest payments for ever since then. And they've been doing it by the mutualization of the losses um, via quantitative easing. So I saw that and then I started looking, okay, if that's the case, then we've got the pandemic payments to come. So then I started looking at the interest payments and I'm like, huh. This looks like a lagged version of the central bank balance sheets. Then we built a global central bank balance sheet indicator and a global liquidity indicator. And we suddenly found that there was this three and a half year lead and it looked pretty much identical. And we're like, wow. So then we started backing out the numbers to say, okay, this looks like it's, it makes sense. Let's look at the interest payments. Let's look at the amount of QE. Let's look at the difference. And it's basically, it adds up. What we found out is that uh, debt growth in excess of GDP growth 
gets monetized, that debt growth in excess of GDP growth is the interest rate payments. And that's when it all started coming together. It's like, holy shit, they're all doing this. They know they're doing it. They're doing it on purpose because it's the only way of managing the debt. Which is why when we're looking forwards, we're seeing the interest payments exploding. Why? Those are the pandemic payments that came through. So the interest payments are exploding because interest rates are higher. So we're seeing them issue bills and not bonds, not three-year, five-year debt. Why? Because they need to get the interest rates down before they can roll it back into the three or five year. So what they do is they pay, you know, rolling three months interest at 5%, 5 percent, five and a half percent, knowing that if they just hang on long enough, keep rates tight enough, they will have the ability to lower rates again. So without having a you know rebound in inflation or being too soon, and they've got the excuse to keep cutting and say, oh my God, oh my God, it's slower than we expected, and inflation's falling, and deflation, we can't have that here, all of this. That's also the reason why, out of the blue, they randomly chose 2% as an inflation target. Um, and everyone's like, why that? Well, because trend rate of GDP growth is 1.75%, and 2% is basically just above that. So you're allowing inflation to eat into the debt, but without it being so significant that it gets out of control. So it was finding bit by bit all of these pieces coming together. And it was like, I wrote them over a series of a series of maybe six articles where I started piecing more and more and more of it together. And then at the end, it all came together and it became the everything code. The everything code. Um, very, very nice. Um, we have, or I have, taken up way too much of Raul's time already. Uh, we do have one final question here, and there's a queue of um, many, many, many more, which I'm afraid we're not going to be able to get to. But uh, the final question will come from uh, listener Ray Fuentes. Uh, no pressure, Ray, but it's your time to shine. Final question for, uh, for Raul. Uh, the the pressure is on. Thank you, Trueflation, for the opportunity to come up and speak and and hosting a very insightful AMA. Raul, uh, what a privilege it is to to learn from you. I appreciate you sharing your your, your expertise uh, with us here today. Uh, my name is Ray Fuentes, Community Director at Link2. Uh, on Monday, we had uh, the privilege of interviewing a. A uh, representative, the uh, VP of products from Circle, his name is Jao Reginato, a brilliant mind. And I, and he, he, he made one comment that I would love to get your uh, input on or perspective, Raul. He, uh, being the fact that Circle, they essentially mirror what I think is, you know, obviously they are the creator of USDC, the stablecoin. Uh, and I'm piggybacking off an earlier conversation you had as well uh, around stablecoins. And my thought was, or why I'm bringing up Zhao's comments is he he said something very peculiar uh, about you know how USDC is backed by short-term uh, treasury bills, and, and, he, and they did that very strategically, uh, led by uh, Jeremy Allaire, the CEO of, of Circle, uh, serial entrepreneur. But where I'm getting at is he mentioned that stable coins or specifically algorithmic stable coins just do not work, and and, and potentially there's something in the future that could. I don't know, something interesting he said that could evolve uh, maybe from st that specific algo back stablecoin or stablecoins in general. Just I would love to get your perspective on on uh, stablecoins. Do you think algorithmic stablecoins hold a future or, or do you think uh, are there is there going to be a migration of uh, or the adoption of similar systems like uh, Circles USDC where it's a stablecoin backed by you know, assets similar, the okay. assets back you know, by the US dollar. Okay, really simple is what are stable coins and why are they so big? Most people don't understand any of this. It's basically because if you are in the Philippines or Nigeria or wherever, it's really hard to get US dollars. So this has democratized the US dollar for everyone. It is extraordinary how powerful it is as a simple technology for most people. It is basically fractionalizing. It's a digital version of the euro dollar market. The euro dollar market is inaccessible to anybody. But here we've got a market where you can borrow, lend, own, buy, sell dollars globally, instantly, frictionlessly. People will take the risk on some of these being imperfectly built because it's better than owning the Nigerian currency or the Philippine peso or whichever currency you get to choose. That is the big use case. You're finding Asian 
um, exporters exporting to other Asian nations don't want to have the US dollar in the middle, something I talked about before. So they are paying in stable coins straight off to get around capital controls. So the euro dollar market became one of the biggest markets the world has ever seen. That is the offshore market for US dollars. This is just that. It's just the tokenization of that to allow the every man to participate. So it's a mind blowingly powerful thing in a US dollar reserve world. In terms of algorithmic stable coins, blah, 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 I don't know, but I don't think that the user in Nigeria or the Philippines or Venezuela or anywhere cares. They just want to send a dollar from here to there quickly or keep their savings in dollars. So that's kind of how I look at it. Um, yes, there'll be other technologies. Yes, people will try different things. We talked about it earlier on the call. Is there a, is there a way you could have a uh, adjusted supply currency? Does that help? gets people off the US dollars. Right now, everybody wants a dollar. The whole world wants dollars. Everyone's in debt dollars. The whole world is basically priced in dollars. All commodities are priced in dollars. And this is the democratization of that. So it'll keep growing. Very, very nice. Uh, we appreciate uh, all the questions and the time, uh, Raul. Uh, thanks so much for doing this. Um, how can uh, Truflation listeners follow your work and, and keep up with uh, with your insights. Yeah, one, there's two ways. Obviously, you can find me on Twitter. You can see me here. The other thing, just so people are aware, is um, we're just at Real Vision launching an incredible new platform with pricing, charting, community tools, um, various AI bots, all sorts of stuff happening. There is a special... This month, That's right? right. So there is a special deal right now because we're going to close the doors on new members while we get the product launch out the door. So um, realvision.com forward slash last chance. And you can basically get a membership where you can see all of the great minds on Real Vision. And then you'll get access to this platform as it rolls out. So realvision.com forward slash last chance, $20.14 for a three month subscription, just so you can get to use it and see the changes that we're building out and hear some of the quality information that happens there. Boom. Um, that is realvision.com forward slash last chance. Thanks so much to the panel, um, to the Truflation team, Omar Yahia of Matter Labs and ZK Sync. Um, we will be back very soon. Uh, there might be a pop up space in the next couple of weeks, so look for that. Um, otherwise, we're back in September. Um, <laughs> Uh, our FOMC discussions and our uh, CPI discussions. Uh, we appreciate you listening. Uh, head over to truflation.com. We're on all the socials. So that's YouTube, Discord, Telegram. You can find us anywhere. Sorry uh, to all those waiting in line uh, for questions. Uh, the man is busy, and uh, we want to make sure that uh, we, we, we respect his time. So, um, again, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We appreciate you, and we will see you next time. 